we have to, as climbers, we have to kind of figure out what our relationship is with struggle. And so for you, uh, do you seek out struggle? Do you, do you thrive off of that, that conflict and that struggle with training or with climbing? Or do you work to try to minimize is struggle as much as possible? I, I wouldn't say I try to minimize struggle. I mean, the thing is, the the bigger the struggle, the better the outcome usually. So whether that's in training or a route, I've noticed that the more you struggle with something, might be a route, might be a training session, might be a boulder, and then you actually end up succeeding on it, it just feels so much more rewarding than, you know, just rocking up to something and climbing it second try. Even though sometimes, you know, the routes you struggle on might be technically grade wise easier than the stuff you've already done you know in flash or second try but actually spending more days struggling with the move struggling with the route and then end up succeeding that is i would say one of the better feelings of uh, of climbing and one of the better feelings there is so i mean i, I kind of look out for struggle i i like to do stuff that doesn't suit my style sometimes just because i mean for the fun of struggling i guess <laughs> Yeah, sure. I agree with that. I mean, I think there, there is uh, the the reward tends to be greater if if a project really puts up a fight. And it's interesting to hear your note there that sometimes it's not even maybe the hardest grade that you've tried to climb. It might just be a style that's different or, or something like that. I think especially when you come closer to your limit, it matters so much, you know, whether the route suits you or not. So if you pick a route that is not your style you'll struggle loads on it and it might end up being two grades easier than you know other stuff you've already climbed that might suit your style but i think that's always part of the game and that's part of the beauty of climbing that different people perform differently in you know granite limestone in different rock types and different lengths of roots and that makes it interesting what what isn't Alex Magos's style, like what, like what would be the anti style for you? Well, the anti style would be a, a big granite slopers, loads of heel hooks and that kind of stuff. I, I'm not good at it. I'm not a big heel hook fan, uh, probably because uh, due to a friend of mine, heel hooks were forbidden in training for a long time. So about a decade of my training, I never heel hooked, which obviously didn't improve my heel hook skills. But <laughs> and we also just never climbed on slopers because my uh, my home area, the front Nira, is just tends to be very pockety and crimpy. So you rarely see any sloper, and obviously that's during my years of teenage years. That's you know the area I spent most time in. So I just can't hold slopers very well. And if you uh, um, if you have to try to pick a style in the World Cup, then it's always jumping around. Uh, I would call it modern bouldering. That's, uh, I'm not very good at that. I think because years of my training was always, if you jump to something, you know, you hold the swing and then you do the next move. But with the modern bouldering style, it's more of a, well, you jump to something, you use the momentum to do the next move straight away. And that's something, if you're not used to it, it takes time and uh, lots of practice to get used to it. Right, right. Yeah, fascinating, man. I, I, I hadn't read in the past that... Um that like your training didn't involve like that there was like heel hooking wasn't allowed. That's very interesting to hear. And, <laughs> uh, you probably aren't doing a whole lot of, uh, heel hooking in, in the Frank and Yura. you know, it's a lot of like monos and like, you know, razor crimps and that kind of thing. So you just, you didn't, you weren't forced to learn that technique. That's no, interesting. exactly. So, I mean, it obviously made me strong in a specific style, but it didn't make me very strong in heel hooking. So, now I'm kind of paying for it a little bit, I, I want to say, in in some sense, because obviously if you want to be a complete climber and if you want to perform throughout all climbing styles, that's something you need to learn, especially for World Cups. He looks very often save you. So now I'm, I'm trying to train those. Obviously it makes it a bit harder if you haven't done it for a long time, but I'm I'm getting better, so uh, it's cool. It's a different game. Well, let's talk about training, um, dive into this a little bit here. All right, y'all, just a quick minute here to talk about every climber's favorite topic, finger strength and how we can build it. And I'm telling you guys, this has changed the game for me. Check out the force board. I've been using it for a while now and I am already seeing the difference in my finger endurance and finger strength. And that's because it's allowing me to precisely dial in what I need in any given workout. 
I mean, it's tiny, so I can throw it in my bag and take it to the crag for my warm up or to the gym or when I'm traveling. It logs everything in the app automatically. I can even see how I stack up against the community with regard to my finger strength. It's gamifying the way I'm training. Dr. Tyler Nelson's been on the show to talk about how effective this kind of training is, and I am loving it. If you're a geek about training your fingers like I am, you got to check out the Force Board. It's cheaper than a pair of climbing shoes, and it's going to level up how you train your fingers. Also, if you use that link below and use code STRUGGLE at checkout, you get 10% off, and the show gets a little bit of love. So get out there, get those strong fingies, and start sending. Where in the past, or even currently, have you struggled with your training? Well, I would say from my youth on, I was always a very, very motivated climber. I was super psyched for training. And when I was around 13 years old, that's when I really got psyched for climbing. And that's when I started climbing two, three, four times a week. Actually, not before that. I was never one of those kids that already climbed, you know, 9A when I was 13 years old. And I haven't, you know, already been training for you know, for years when I was 13 years old, it kind of just started when I was 12, 13 years old. But I quickly realized that climbing is my type, my type of thing. And I got so psyched that by the age of like 20, 21, maybe, I, um, I started getting uh, injuries because uh, I was not, well, I was kind of overdoing it a little bit. So I was actually training so, so much that, um, yeah, I uh, started to get injuries in my fingers and um, I had to deal with that. I needed to adjust my training. I needed to uh, change um, my training a little bit uh, in order to uh, stay injury free. Yeah, let, let's talk about that a little bit, uh, because I think that's very common for climbers. We we get psyched. We want to train like crazy. Um, oftentimes, you know, if we don't feel totally pumped out of our minds, we don't feel like it was like a complete gym session. So how have you, as you've gotten older and have dealt with injuries, how has your training schedule changed? And how do you look at rest days or variety of, of training in a way that you, that you didn't in the past? Well, when I was young, rest days pretty much didn't exist, I feel like, <laughs> especially in the time between when I was 20 to 25, I almost didn't rest at all just because I I felt like I was a professional climber and a professional climber needs to go to the gym and needs to train. I always felt I was kind of being useless when I was not at the gym training and doing my profession. Although, I mean, everybody who works obviously also has weekends and that kind of stuff. And nobody works seven days a week, at least most people don't. And especially in, in climbing, that also doesn't work. So I, I can remember climbing some years back, you know, 28 days in a row on climbing trips in Bishop. And that obviously was not very beneficial for my skin and also not very beneficial for my body. And I started, well, getting the receipt for that when I was maybe, you know, 23, 24, I started getting inflammations in my fingers. I started um, rupturing a few pulleys and I realized that I needed to adjust my training and I kind of went away from doing, you know, crimping on overhanging boards seven times a week to, uh, you know, crimping only maybe four or five times a week and then doing some antagonist training. And then I got maybe the next injury. I realized, okay, maybe training five days on the same style is still too much, you know, five days a week. So... And then I went over to incorporating more rest days and also diversifying my training a little bit and training my weaknesses, not always training on small crimps, you know, every week. So uh, that helped a lot. And for about, yeah, two and a half years now, I'm injury free. I would say I am more of a complete climber. And yeah, I think uh, that was uh, good changes I've made. So the rest days and and the lower volume of training that you've been doing hasn't made you weaker. It hasn't had a negative impact on on your development. I would say it had a very positive impact, um, especially because if you don't give your body any rest, I mean, all the training sessions are kind of useless because, you know, the training sessions and the work that you put in only kind of pay off if you also give your body a time to adapt to it, give your tendons time to adapt for it and actually build up muscles. If you constantly keep hitting your body day in, day out, then 
I mean, you might feel like you're doing loads, but it's actually not that effective. So, uh, yeah, even though it was hard to incorporate rest days, I think it was uh, beneficial for my uh, climbing and training. And is a rest day for you a truly a rest day? Read a book, watch a movie, or are you running or cycling or doing something that's more a kind of an active recovery? Typically, like four hours of campus boarding on a rest day, but that's <laughs> that's really. <laughs> Sorry, Alex no. Vegas rest. <laughs> well, there have been uh, moments in the past where, uh, you know, on a on a supposedly rest day, I came to the gym and, you know, my coach Dickie, we met over there and I was like, oh, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, I'm just doing like a little bit of campus boarding, you know? And then that, that became like the running gag and the, the joke always that, I'm doing, you know, a bit of stretching and antagonist training on the campus board, which obviously doesn't work. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I do like to go running. I, I mean, I don't run very long or very far or very fast, but I, I enjoy it. And I also think for an active recovery, it can be good um, if you don't overdo it. And I think stretching and yoga is something you can always do. I have yeah, found yoga as another passion besides climbing for well, quite a few years now. And love doing handstands, love stretching, that kind of stuff. It is, it's a little bit of a meditation sometimes, but it's also just relaxation for me to do yoga, sometimes listen to music, sometimes listen to a podcast while I'm stretching. That's uh, awesome. And that's something I count as a rest day because uh, it is more recovering for the body than just sitting around not doing anything the whole day.